Hello, this is Pastor Jones here at Valley Assembly of God welcoming you to our Wednesday night Bible study. And I hope that you have been uh, coming our way every week. This is a wonderful study about the Christian worker. And, you know, every one of us are to be workers for the Lord. And uh, we're going to cover every aspect of the Christian worker before the study is over. Tonight we're starting a segment that's going to take me a number of weeks. Uh, I don't want to go so long in uh, these Wednesday nights that uh, you begin to turn it off. I want it long enough to where you'll stay with me, that you'll drink in some wonderful truths from God's Word. And uh, so we'll stretch it out maybe just a little more than what we had anticipated. But the subject starting tonight is the worker's isolation. Which, which comes down to this, getting alone with God. And I'm afraid that in our isolation right now because of the pandemic, it does not always equate to being alone with God. There's a lot of depression, a lot of discouragement, uh, a lot of uh, tension inside of homes right now. That's not getting alone with God. Uh, the, the thing that I want to focus on is you and I getting alone with the Lord, being isolated with Him. And being benefited and blessed and more fully equipped for what God has for you and I. Before we get into it, let me just thank you for joining with us. Uh, thank you for coming back into the sanctuary at 10 o'clock on Sunday mornings. Thank you once again for your faithful giving. I can't tell you how much that means at such a time as this. Tonight we are in the book of Ezekiel. The third chapter, the 24th verse, is my text. We find here... There's a command that the Lord gives to the prophet Ezekiel. He says this, Go shut thyself within thine house. He was prohibited from speaking any further to this rebellious household of Israel. It was, he was to withdraw himself into seclusion. The command may be taken to apply to you and I in the Christian life. As indicative of the Lord's desire that his children shall be much alone with himself, he is continually saying to us, let me see thy countenance. Let me hear thy voice. For sweet is thy voice, and thy countenance is comely. The Song of Solomon, the second chapter, the 14th verse. God desires to spend time with you, and I hope you desire to spend time with God. We have not only the desire of the Lord here expressed, it's more than an expression, it's really a command that we should dwell in the secret place of his presence. But there are unnumbered blessings that come to us when we do that, and I want to talk to you about that. We're going to focus the line of our thought upon the shut doors of Scripture, illustrating and bringing out some of the blessings that come to the man or woman that shuts himself in with God. Before we get into it, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you tonight for your word. We pray, God, bring it alive to us. And God, may we understand and grasp the importance, the necessity of being shut in with you. May your anointing be on your word. May your anointing be on your messenger. Now we pray. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. The very first thing that I want to show you is this. The shut door is a place of safety. When Lot was in danger of being ill-used by the Sodomites in Genesis 19 and 10, the angels pulled him into the house and they shut the door. And being in the house, he was safe from the unholy hands of the men of Sodom. The Christian worker friend is also in danger. Amid the dust and the din of life, lest the world would pull him down into the dirt of worldliness and thus soil the garments of your spiritual life. Lot would never have been in such a position of danger if he had kept himself separated. And that's true of you and I. If we flirt with the world, there's always the danger of being besmirched by the world. Something similar happens in the lives of God's children as it did in Lot when he was rescued. Through willfulness or compromise with some truth or hesitation at some specific commandment, 
We find ourselves in peril like Lot found himself in peril when he compromised. From that which they have to be rescued. As Lot was rescued, we have to be rescued. And thank God for the Lord's gracious intervention. The special point to which we draw attention to, it was not till Lot was behind the shut door that he was saved. The men of Sodom would have handled him roughly if he had remained outside. The lesson for us is when we find ourselves in danger of contamination from worldly association through unwatchfulness, the only place of safety, the only place of restoration is to shut ourselves in with the Lord, confess the wrong, and abide with the Lord in the secret prayer place in the future, because if we don't, we won't stay free from contamination. But if we do, there'll be sweet communion with God himself. The second door, the shut door, if you would, is the place of searching. In the 13th and 14th chapter of the book of Leviticus, there are certain directions given as to cases which showed signs of leprosy. In an unmistakable case of leprosy, these directions don't apply. But where there is a mere suspicion of leprosy, they did. Whether it was of the individual, a garment, the house. What I want to look at for a moment here is in the case of the individual. He was to be shut up for seven days. On the seventh day, the priest was to examine the man, and he found the plague was at stay. Then the man had to be shut up seven more days. And on the fourteenth day, the priest found the plague spread not in the skin. Then the priest pronounced him clean, for the spot was only a scab. Leviticus 13, 1 through 6. You say, what does this have to do with us in the 21st century? Well... The one thing to which reference is made here is this. All the while the man was shut up, it was a time of testing. And we can quite understand that while what heart searching and fears would have gone through that man. Put yourself in his shoes for just a moment. We may take this as an illustration, if you would, of the believer we find him in the secret place in the Lord's presence. We don't have to fear his searching process. For God, as he searches you and I out, it is a time of growth in the Lord Jesus Christ. A growing in God's grace. When the Lord touched the thigh of our self-will like he touched Jacob's thigh when Jacob wrestled with God, it makes us conscious of our weakness. It is but to make Israel's of us, having power with himself. Don't you want to have power with God? I know I do. The power that people have with men, it fades in time. You watch what's been going on in our society and the strivings of men after places of power and position. Let me tell you something. 50 years from now, maybe only 10 years from now, it really won't make much difference in those people's lives. They'll be gone. But to you and I, who don't just live for the moment, we live for an eternity with God. It's something to look forward to and to enjoy forever and ever in God. When the Lord makes us conscious of our sins of omission and leads us to cry with Isaiah the prophet, I have been dumb, therefore I'm a man of unclean lips. It is that we may be better fitted for future service. When the Lord allows some bodily affliction to assail us and we cry for the removal of the thorn in the flesh like the apostle Paul did. As we wait upon the Lord, we find that he wants to prove in our experience the reality of his all-sufficient grace and to know the joy which comes in having fellowship with him in our moment of a Gethsemane experience. He gives 
and pours out upon us lessons that can only be learned as we're shut in with God. When he turns the searchlight of his holiness upon our ways and, and reveals us to ourselves, it is that we may see our defects and remedy them by allowing him to adjust us. You know, some people, they go to a chiropractor to get a, a back adjustment. We need to go into God's presence and have him lay his hands on us and adjust us. That we might be the men and women of God that God has intended us to be. An adjustment. For when he tells us the truth about ourselves, he always bids us to buy the gold of his blessing. And when he rebukes our self-confidence, as he did in Peter's case, it's but to make us confident in himself. Don't put your confidence in yourself. Put your confidence in him this evening. You'd be so glad you did. All these things are happily learned in the secret of his presence. And unless we get there, listen, unless we get into the secret of his presence, somebody needs to hear this tonight. There's going to be despondency, murmuring, complaining, it's going to fill our hearts, and we are going to be the worst for it, and we're going to be full of grief. Alone with the Lord, Jacob found out his crookedness and the patience of God's grace. Alone with the Lord, that great man Daniel discovered his uncomeliness and the ravishing beauty of God's glory. Alone with the Lord, Job was made conscious of his vileness and the almightiness of God's power. Alone with the Lord, Moses got to know his unfitness for God's service and the secret of his plans. Alone with the Lord, that great prophet Isaiah, had revealed to him his uncleanness and the sufficiency of God's atonement. Alone with the Lord, Peter owned his own self-confidence and learned the blessedness of God's love. Alone with the Lord, John saw the evil of man and the grandness of God's purpose. George Muir, that great man of God of years ago, in unfolding the secrets of a life of sanctity and service, said this, There came a day when I died utterly, first to George Mueller, and second to my fellow man. And so saying, he bowed himself down almost to the ground, expressing by his attitude what he sought also to express by word. He added, not till I became totally indifferent to what George Mueller thought, desired, and preferred, to George Mueller's opinions, taste, purpose, and also to the blame and to the praise the censure or the applause of my fellow man and determined henceforth I would seek no apparition but that of God and did I ever start on a life of happiness and holiness. But from that day until now, I have been content to live alone with God. Those are words of a great man of God who found the benefit and the blessing of being shut in with the Lord. That brings me to my third one. The shut door is a place of supply. When the widow came with her complaint to, the, to Elisha and told him that her sons were likely to be made slaves because she could not meet the creditor's claim, one of the first things he wanted to know was what she had in her house. What do you got? What do you got? And once she responds, the handmaid hath not anything in the house save a pot of oil. She had something, but it was not sufficient to meet her own need, leaving out the obligation of her liability. How like many of God's people, they have the oil of God's grace within them, but even that is not sufficient to sanctify or satisfy them for they have such a scant supply. How much of God do you have? How much of God do you have? 
an eyedropper? Or have you waited upon the Lord and allowed him to rent the heavens and pour out upon you his bounty and his blessing? The direction of the prophet to this widow was that she was to get all the empty vessels she could and shut herself in the house with her sons and pour out from the pot of oil that she had. What did the woman do? The Bible said she shut the door and did as Elijah told her, 2 Kings 4, 2 through 6. The consequence was she not only had sufficient to meet her own liabilities, but she, but she and her sons had a source of supply for the time to come. She met her liability without by the supply that she got within. Listen, we're going to meet the liabilities without from the supply we receive from God when we shut ourselves in with him. Hence, she illustrates the main principle of the Christian life. The measure of our giving out, whether you're a preacher or a lay person, is circumscribed, circumscribed by the quantity that we take in. By the quantity that we take in. One of the things which is patent to every prayerful and careful reader of the New Testament is what we might call the inness of the spiritual life or spiritual things which feed and fashion the spiritual life. Let's call to mind a few. The spear of the believer's walk is in the light, 1 John 1.7. The light of God's holy presence and truth. For as there are three properties in the rays of sunlight, namely illumination, healing, and warmth. So as we walk in the light, we are warmed by God's love into obedience. We're healed by his gracious word. And to our betterment and enlightenment by the truth of the knowledge that he gives us. The soil in which the believer grows is in grace, 2 Peter 3 and 18. Grace is to the child of God what soil is to the plant. It nourishes it and strengthens it. The secret of the believer's safety is to be kept, to be kept in the power of God, 1 Peter 1, 5. The source of the believer's fruitfulness is found as he abides in the divine vine, John 15 and 4. This abiding is freely expressed as he that keepeth his commandments, 1 John 3 and 24. You see, divine life courses through our spiritual being as a consequence and manifests itself in the fruit of the Spirit. Have you checked the fruit lately? How much of the fruit of the Spirit do you see abiding in your heart and life as a believer? The spring of the believer's action is known as he keeps himself in the love of God, Jude 21. The sanctifier of the believer's heart and life is the truth of God, for as he moves in it, he will answer Christ's prayer that he may be sanctified in the truth, John 17 and 17. It brings us to the last point. The supply of the believer's need. You have a need today? Is ever met as he is praying in the Holy Ghost, Jude 20. This last is the secret of all the rest. For the only way to know the inness of the former things as we abide in the attitude of prayer. You've got to spend time with God. Not just talking. Not just asking for things. But hearing the voice of God. Allowing the God to guide and direct your life. The praying of the Holy Spirit, my friends, will keep us in the secret of the Lord's presence, press us into the soil of his grace, preserve us in 
the Lord's keeping. Keep us in the flow of divine life. Cause us to move with holy energy. Encircle us with God's truth and enable us to rejoice in the supply of heaven's blessing. Which one of us couldn't use a little of heaven's blessing right now? Let me ask you something. How long has it been since you've been shut in with God? Next week we're going to pick this up and talk about the shut door in the place of intercession. You will not want to miss. Bow your heads with me, please. Heavenly Father, we thank you now for this time that we've enjoyed together. It's always enjoyable when we gather around the Word of God. And Lord, this message and these messages to come are so important right now. Because Lord, in this busy, busy, busy day and hour, people don't take time to wait upon you. I pray forgive us for that, Lord. And help us to make the needed adjustments to allow ourselves to be shut in with you. Oh, we'll be so much the better for it. Father, if there be anyone under the sound of my voice tonight that does not know you, may they open their hearts and lives to you right now and invite Jesus in. And God, as they simply do that, may you assist them and help them to live for you all the days of their life. Father, I pray, may we spend a little more time in prayer between now and Sunday. And Lord, may you lay the groundwork for a great day of the Lord. Keep us in your safekeeping. And Father, we can't thank and praise you enough. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, folks. So good to have you with us tonight. Have a great rest of the week, and we'll see you soon. Amen.